Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Bill Grunenberg. I'm reporting for All Space Considered. And we're talking today with Dylan Dong. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yep, that's right. Okay. And you are a Caltech uh, uh, postgraduate working on your PhD. Is that right? Yeah. Or, yeah, OK. And <clears throat> you made a discovery that I found just fascinating. And, and um, as I was saying in our little pre-talk, just really fundamental. It feels like fundamental astrophysics. So the first thing I'd like you to do, if you can, is uh, Describe briefly and, you know, language people who aren't astrophysicists will get what, what you actually discovered. Sure thing. So basically the story starts with uh, one massive star. And prior to this, people really thought that, or prior to the, like the past decade or so, people really thought that stars sort of just sit off on their own in space and they go about their business and they go through their entire lives and, you know, whatever happens, happens to them. But what we learned in the last decade or so is that actually most massive stars are born in pairs or triples or quadruples or even more. Wow. Uh, and so we're really beginning to see the full range of things that can happen when you have two stars that are basically twins born at the same time uh, and how they can influence their lives, uh, each other's lives. So our story begins with two massive stars that were born uh, in a very close binary. And one of them, uh, blew up in a supernova and left behind a black hole or a neutron star. That's the remnant whenever you have some sort of core collapse supernova. And the other one is still living its life as a massive star. So this uh, black hole or neutron star is pretty close by to this other star. And it starts eventually siphoning off mass from the atmosphere of the other star. You get uh, basically a stream of mass getting pulled off of the star onto the black hole or neutron star. And eventually uh, this causes the black hole of the neutron star to spiral in and plunge into the atmosphere of the other star. And within that star, uh, it starts to sink. It starts to, it's still orbiting the center of that star, but it's also sinking as it's orbiting. And as it's sinking, it's basically splashing out the entire atmosphere. Think of like a garden hose spraying it out into space. Right. And this whole process, we think, probably takes a few centuries. And by the time it reaches the core, uh, this material has been splashed out to like 10,000 times the size of the original star. Uh, and meanwhile, when the black hole or the neutron star reaches the core, it starts all of a sudden uh, siphoning in huge amounts of mass at once. And what forms is called an accretion disk in the center of the star. Uh, and in the secretion disk, there are all sorts of magnetic fields that are tangled up. And this process releases a huge amount of energy. It launches a jet at close, this, close to the speed of light. And that jet uh, basically bores its way out of the star and uh, releases X-rays as it breaks out of the star. And that's what we saw uh, in 2014 with the Maxi instrument on the International Space Station. Meanwhile, all the energy that was released at the core of the star explodes the star. And the guts of the star, the star doesn't get vaporized. The guts of the star actually fly outwards. Right? And uh, as the, those guts fly outwards, they eventually catch up to all the things that, like the garden hose that uh, was released centuries before. Uh, the, the guts of the star basically crashes into all that slower moving material. And that crash is what we call shock. And that shock is what produces the luminous radio emission that we saw later with the Very Large Array. So, and was that how you first discovered this thing? Was it was it the radio emissions and, and up from that shock? Okay, that's what I thought I had read. So, were you guys looking for this? I mean, because I know this had been theorized as a possibility, or was it you found some interesting kind of anomalous stuff and and you know and then uh, came up with this uh, explanation, this model? Oh, definitely the second one. I, I had oh, okay. no idea this model even existed before. Uh, really? Yeah. Who, now, who did the who did the theorizing on this? I mean, who who first uh, you know suggested this could happen? This particular uh, scenario, the specific one, was first suggested by Roger Chevalier in 2012. Okay. Uh, and what he was trying to do was he was trying to explain why you have certain supernovae with huge amounts of mass that are sitting right outside of where the explosion site was. Uh, it's known that stars uh, lose lots of their atmospheres uh, 
maybe a few years or a few decades before uh, before exploding. In our case, a few centuries, most likely. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's still an active area of research as to why they lose that mass. Yeah. Is that what's going on with Betelgeuse now? I mean, is that is that part of what's you know been happening with that and, and the dimming and the... Yeah, so uh, stars lose mass throughout their lives. And yeah, yeah, true. Uh, I don't think that uh, Betelgeuse is about to explode. Uh, no, 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 I, I didn't suggest that. Although uh, we, we have, there's somebody at work who has said that uh, it should happen in the next 100,000 years, the, the supernova, but next Tuesday is in the next 100,000 years. So. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, so I find this kind of fundamental and, and um, because it's a new type of supernova that has not been observed before. And uh, is this going to be your PhD thesis? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a big part of my PhD thesis. Sure, um, sure. I have other results, which will hopefully also be published. Soon. Oh, wow. You know, send them to me. I, we might have to have you on again. <laughs> um, now, of course, what I thought of uh, originally when I first read the article was, and we were talking about this before we started recording, um, a type 1a supernova where you have a small compact object, in that case, a white dwarf and a large star. And, you know, and it, and it just accretes stuff off and then you got runaway nuclear fusion and stuff. Why did that not happen in this case? Why did this one barrel into and actually, um, um, you know, dive right into its uh, companion star? A type 1a supernova, at least the leading model of it, is that you have two white dwarfs that are uh, basically on a collision course. And yeah. those white dwarfs basically fuse. Right? So a white dwarf is some compact object. It's about the size of the Earth. Uh, and maybe it's like half the mass of the sun or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, whereas in our case, we have uh, either a neutron star or a black hole and an absolutely massive star. So yeah. this massive star is probably like you know, uh, a few tens the times of the sun, uh, times the size of the sun, and size or mass, uh, possibly both. Oh, it's, okay, it's unclear. Yeah, yeah. Um, and a neutron star is basically like if you crammed the entire mass of the sun into the size of New York, right? Yeah, uh, like New York City, wow. not not New York yeah. State, New York City. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's small. Uh, and a black hole is even smaller. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's like sure. the fundamental limit as to how small you can cram uh, some mass into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yes. imagine like a speck of dust basically orbiting this absolutely massive star. Yeah. And uh, that speck of dust makes its way inside of the star and yeah. cannibalizes it from the inside out. Yeah, that's crazy. I um, The idea that, uh, you know, I think the article I read said it disrupted you know the the uh, the internal of the of the companion star, but it sounds like uh, what you're saying is it did what it does, which is create an accretion disk and start you know swallowing matter basically. And is it that it it uh, took so much matter out of the uh, the core of that star that there was no fuel left, or how did it actually stop the the, the fusion process, or did it stop the fusion process? Um, you know what actually happened in that in that core? Yeah, so. I like to think of it as uh, when you have a regular supernova, you're basically creating one of these objects right, at the mm -hmm. core. But here, you're sort of bringing it in from the outside. Oh, that makes thing. a lot of sense. You know, yeah. you're, you're collapsing onto this object, and then uh, it's releasing a huge amount of energy, and that energy causes you know, a rebound, and uh, you get lots of neutrinos coming out and all that jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how confident are you that your model is is the correct description of what happened? Um, yeah, so what we did uh, when we found these really weird uh, observations was we looked at pretty much every model that was out there and we tried yeah, to make right. them work. Okay. Uh, and, and this one fit. And this is the only one that, that worked. So the, you know, the, the, uh, the radio wave, the transit radio emissions that came from the, the matter running into the other matter, was that a specific wavelength? Is that how you idea? Is that like a fingerprint of this exact kind of thing happening, or or was it just massive, you know, radio emissions that were transient? I mean, what? Yeah. You know, yeah. So uh, the particular radio frequency that we're looking at, three gigahertz, traces essentially uh, a particular size scale. So we're looking at uh, something like ten to the seventeen centimeters. And I know mm. you know that's a very weird number to think about, but yeah. that's basically uh okay uh let's see That's wavelength the light years um <laughs> so a parsec is three times 10 to the 18 so it's about a tenth of a light year or so yeah. oh okay all right 
Yeah. Wow. So um, things that were there really, really strong shocks that are of the order the size of a tenth of a light year uh, mm -hmm. will be extremely luminous, will peak at around the frequency that we're observing. And so we'll see more of those events. Uh, are you and looking so that's for what we're treating. I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt. But yeah. you, so you, are you going to, can you like write an algorithm that'll just sort of scan data and find this kind of thing happening again? Or how do you do that? Yeah. So you asked me about my thesis. What my thesis really is, is uh, I've basically data mined the entire VLA sky survey. I've made mm -hmm. a catalog of all the millions of radio sources there in the sky. And I'm looking for how the radio sky changes over the course of years to decades. So the supernova happened, not, not the first one, but the second one with the, with the uh, uh, I don't know, consumption of the, of the, you know, the object. And by the way, if you had to put money on it, would you guess neutron star or black hole for the second, for the compact object? I would guess black hole. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah. Um, so do you think that the remnant of this most recent supernova is another black hole, the larger black hole? And yeah, so I think most likely what happened uh, is, you know, you had a black hole that entered and then it ate some mass and just became, you know, one single larger black hole. And yeah, even yeah. if it was a neutron star, it probably ate enough mass that it would have collapsed into a black hole. And yeah, so yeah. you just have a black hole at the end. Yeah, you kind of have two star cores worth of material now, right? Basically, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, do you, so do you think this is a common occurrence? Do you think this happens, you know, fairly often? It's actually really unclear um, how often this kind of thing happens. So there have been theoretical predictions for how often neutron stars enter their companions and settle to the core. Mm -hmm. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think uh, this is supposed to happen once every 5,000 years or so in a galaxy the size of the Milky Way. Which means a lot just because there's so many galaxies. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, based on just this one detection that we have within our search, uh, I'm able to say it probably happens more often than once every you know 10 million years in a galaxy the size of the Milky Way or so. But mm. it's possible that you know there are other manifestations of this kind of phenomenon that we just haven't observed. And so, yeah. you know, yeah. it could be a lot more common. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else are you, uh, this, this probably won't make it into the interview, but I'm just curious. What else are you interested in looking for? What other, and are you interested in doing any um, like theoretical astrophysics or, or you mainly want to go out there and find stuff? Yeah, so I think, I think of myself as sort of a theoretically inclined observer. Right? A lot of uh, observational astronomers don't really want to like dig into theory papers and you know think about the physics. I mean, you have to do it as an observer sure, sure. Like, yeah. in modern astronomy, but uh, I enjoy reading that kind of stuff. Right? Oh, and, nice. Uh, I'll let go. <laughs> you know, I, I enjoy sort of doing like order of magnitude calculations. I'm not sure that I'll be like coding up the next greatest simulation or like you know uh, doing three pages of integrals or anything like that. But yeah, yeah. Uh, anything that you can sort of uh, like it's like the you know the classic how many piano tuners are there in the city of Chicago kind of yes. question. Like that's yeah. the kind of question I love. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And if you can do those kinds of calculations informed by you know an understanding of uh, theory, then uh, and if you can do that to interpret uh, your observations in a way that is maybe a little bit deeper than you know other people might do, like that's that's the kind of thing that I try to do. I have a feeling we're going to be interviewing you again in the future. Okay, so here's part two. Um, and go ahead. Uh, if, is there anything else that, in other words, if you were the interviewer, what would you ask yourself? Ooh, wow, that's a really good question. What would I ask myself? Yeah. Um, I, think, I got one for you. Yeah. Why do you think this hasn't been discovered prior to now? Why has this not been discovered prior to now? Well, uh, prior to now, we haven't had the sort of wide field, sensitive, high resolution radio survey. Mm. This really was made possible by several technological developments. So in something like 2010, the VLA went, underwent this large uh, hardware upgrade mm -hmm. uh, where it became, it was known as like the expanded VLA at some point, and then it got changed to the Jansky Very Large Array, and then now it's just the VLA, but it's still called the Jansky Very Large Array. Anyways, right, right, right. Um, it's it's basically a lot more sensitive, and uh, 
it's not only more sensitive, you also get a lot more bandwidth in each band. Instead mm -hmm. of having like uh, a small chunk of frequency that you're observing with uh, each receiver, you're actually basically continuously sampling uh, every frequency between one and, I think the VLA goes up to like higher than 50 gigahertz now. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. So anyways, um, what that gives you is two things. So it gives you a lot of sensitivity, uh, but it also gives you the ability to really uh, see the whole shape of all the radio sources that you're seeing or that you mm -hmm. observe, at least if you take the right kinds of observations. And so the first thing, the sensitivity allowed the VLA to survey the entire sky in a time efficient manner. Right? Mm -hmm. Like you can, you can observe the entire sky. And even though your field of view is relatively small as the VLA, uh, you only have to spend five seconds looking at every different part of the sky. And that's mm -hmm. what the VLA is doing. It's, yeah. it's really just uh, all the 27 dishes are basically slewing across the sky, sky continuously. Uh, and it's taking advantage of yet another technological development, which is called, this is this new observing mode called on-the-fly mapping. Uh, and what on-the-fly mapping is, is you're continuously slewing your dishes instead of like pointing, uh, shooting, and then repointing, and then shooting. Right. Uh, so it's continuous. And, sorry? So it's continuous. It's continuous, continuous, that's right. Nice. Yeah. And that just like saves you a ton of time. Uh, yeah. You don't have to wait for the dishes to settle or anything like that. Uh, yeah. And there's some uh, technical wizardry happening on the back end where you're basically uh, re like electronically repointing the telescope by introducing different delays in the signal path. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and the other thing, of course, uh, radio telescopes don't need to wait for the sun to go down, right? I mean, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. You can work those you can observe all yeah. any, any time of day. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, your question was, why hasn't this been observed before? Yeah, because yes. we, we haven't had the VLA sky survey before. We, we okay. simply have not had uh, the sort of wide field, sensitive, uh, high resolution survey over multiple epochs. I was just, this is sort of a simple question, but is there is there any point uh, in the future where you'll have enough data on this particular event to know whether that initial object was a neutron star or a black hole, or is that just, it's just impossible to, to detect? Oh, I think by far the best evidence is going to come from uh, if we're able to find more of these. If we can assemble a statistical sample and see, you know, what, it, what are all the variations of what can happen, right? And it's possible actually that supernovae that we've already observed are actually due to this sort of mechanism, uh, and we just haven't realized it yet. Right? Yeah, like, I thought about I, that. I yeah. wondered. I was going to ask that question. As a matter of fact, uh, were our previous supernovae possibly this kind, and they just didn't know it? Yeah, yeah I um, think it's absolutely possible. Uh, this is actually yeah. what motivated Chevalier in 2012 to write his paper in the first place. Yeah. Was yeah. Uh, this question of why do you have this high density sitting right outside of a supernova? Uh, because what that implies is that uh, your star, before it blew up, went through some eruptive mass loss, not just like ordinary winds that you see coming off of stars. There's some sort of eruption where it basically shed off its outer layers of skin, like really quickly. Mm -hmm. And you know why would that happen uh, synchronized so closely with when it ultimately blew up as a supernova? Mm -hmm. And, it, and you think it's a, like a, a possibility of a compact object in each case that is that is pulling the stuff off and making that torus. And, yeah, 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 that's that's absolutely a possibility. Uh, yeah. If that compact object is able to trigger the supernova, right? And that's that's the big if. That that's why we know that it's a uh, that the thing that's throwing off the mass is a neutron star or a black hole, uh, yeah. because otherwise, if you just throw another star into the star, then it just you know, it's like, thank it's you very mass. much. Uh, you fed yeah, me. That's right. I, have, <laughs> I have more hydrogen yeah, yeah. to burn now. I'm no actually going to live longer. Yeah. Is this uh, type of supernova so new that it will have a new number? We have the 1A, B, Cs, the 2, we even have 3, 4, and 5, I understand. Is this <laughs> going to get its own number? Um, so that uh, classification system is basically based on uh, the early time optical spectra of supernovae. And okay. so... Uh, I think you could probably call what we saw at late times a type 2n. Uh, so type 2 means that there's hydrogen 
an N means that there's a narrow line. And that narrow line oftentimes indicates that there's strong interaction with the circumstellar medium. But uh, those are really just like descriptive ways of uh, trying to classify different kinds of supernovae. And they don't necessarily tell you uh, what made the star explode. Oh, okay, okay. Because I have always um, I have a simpler understanding of that, and and mine was always that the one A was the the you know the red giant, the white dwarf, starting off two white dwarfs, and, or and the type two would always be the, the core collapse of a really large star when it runs out of fuel, and, and but uh, but it's actually not necessarily that. It is this detection that you're talking about hydrogen, and and the line you're talking about is that the sodium line. No, or, it's the no. Uh, it's the hydrogen alpha line. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, uh, type 1As, by the way, are uh, very much white dwarfs that explode. That's pretty well established. And yeah, type 2s yeah. are generally these massive stars that do undergo core collapse. But right. the reason why they undergo core collapse, uh, there is several reasons why they might do so. Yeah, yeah. But this is one of them. I mean, this, this is, is a compact object invading yeah. and getting into the center. And yeah, yeah. This is, we think, think now, uh, one of them. Yeah. 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 Well, this is really fascinating stuff, Dylan. I, I'm sure you must be very excited. How did you guys celebrate when you realized what you had found? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, <laughs> I celebrated by doing like years of really hard work trying to like make sure that this is what we found. Uh, oh, but, yeah. So going yeah, over yeah. everything? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I sent Greg a very, uh, a very excited email when we found this thing. Um, what's the, this, I, now I'm just, you know, spitballing here, but like, what's the next thing? I mean, is there a specific new thing you'd like to look for, or will you just continue to sort of search through data and, and uh, identify things as, as you know, nature gives them to you? Yeah, I, I really like the approach of searching through data and identifying things as nature gives them to me. Because if I'm looking for something in particular, then you, know, you sort of put on the blinders and you go, you know, I'm only looking for this thing and I'm gonna throw away everything that you know, might be right. interesting that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. that wasn't what I expected already. Yeah, that, that's very wise, especially for a guy your age, so young. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. Yeah, but the reason why we found, found this thing in the first place was that uh, we were doing this sort of blind search, right? Yeah. Where uh, we were open-minded about what we might find. And right. we had some idea of what we'd be looking for. Otherwise we'd be chasing down every single rabbit hole. There's like sure. thousands of these sources that are appearing in the sky and you have to, you know, know which ones to spend your time on to really dig into. Uh, Were you specifically looking for transient events? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that's the first thing that we're looking for. Sources that uh, were not only transient, but they appeared in the sky rather than disappearing from the sky. Because if they appeared, then there's a hope of, you know, continuing to observe them and uh, being able to gather more information about them. Mm -hmm. The second thing we looked for was an association with uh, nearby galaxies, or at least galaxies within like uh, 600 million light years or so. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason why we did that was, uh, well, a couple fold. Uh, one was that if it's nearby, then you're able to gather information about it with follow-up yeah. observations. It's probably not too faint. And uh, second of all, you know, when it's nearby, you can be pretty sure where on the galaxy it's located. Mm -hmm. So we specifically looked for things that were not at the centers of their galaxies. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is, imagine if you looked up at the radio sky with radio goggles, what you would see is basically uh, the jets that are being launched out of supermassive black holes. Like pretty mm -hmm. much every dot in the sky would be that. Oh, wow. Uh, That's interesting. Like. That's, yeah, it, it's super interesting. There, there's like a lot of really cool science that can be done with these objects that are called active galactic nuclei. But sure. yeah. at, at the same time, if you're looking for something entirely new, then you can't be looking at the thing that dominates the sky. Right? And so right. what we're looking for is things that are not at the centers of their galaxies and so are not likely to be these active galactic nuclei. Yeah. Okay, well, Dylan, thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate your taking the time to uh, talk about this, this really incredible discovery. This is, this is just a, a very interesting new piece, of, um, new piece of the puzzle of the universe, I think. So thank you, Dylan. You're gonna go on yeah. to do great things. Thanks, Bill, appreciate it. All right.